our COVID. We are a bit away from that, so we are safe. Oh, so, you are much safer, uh, eh? your campus. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. campus. Okay. Hey, Tad. Tad is joining in from Brock University. Rahul is joining in from Princeton. Uh, okay, so Yamunu, you want to uh, get going? I will. Yeah. Just, uh, okay. I, will, I will briefly introduce you. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, so that should be, work, right? Uh, oh, you have already attached your screen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Not. Oh no. Wait a minute. Oh. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. So let me let me just say a few words. Uh, it is a real pleasure to to introduce somebody who I have had the delight of knowing now for uh, two decades, uh, approximately. Uh, Yamunu uh, Gunaratne, who is a uh, Morse professor at uh, of physics at the University of Houston. Uh, so Yamunu would be our uh, second speaker of the series. By the way, we do have a lecture next week, which is unusual, but it turned out that Professor Simcoe is available next week, so uh, we'll, we'll do it. So uh, Gemunu is a, is a, is a distinguished uh, senior nonlinear dynamicist who has worked on an array of problems, uh, ranging between turbulence and networks and financial markets and so on. If you need to make money, you can certainly consult him. I haven't uh, made it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, he, he did his PhD, uh, he comes from Sri Lanka actually, he, he did his PhD with uh, uh, Mitchell Feigenbaum uh, at Cornell. And he finished in 1986 and spent some time at the University of Chicago uh, before, uh, before joining Houston in 1990. And he has been in Houston ever since. Actually, I visited him a good many times by now. And they have a fantastic, uh, fantastic group out there, very energizing and, and, I, and I can't say enough good things about this about this humble person. I asked him for a CV, but he refused to give it to me. So I had to make up whatever whatever it is I could, and my apologies uh, my apologies for that. So there you go. Now it's all yours. The model okay. feedback for control. Okay. So the problem I'm talking about is uh, network control, and the the problem was motivated by the following question: If you know somebody has a has a disease like a genetic related disease, can you design a therapy for that person? Uh, yeah, is it even conceptually possible? And so that was the question that, that motivated this study. Here are like a few people on, on the left are people who work with, uh, with my group at the University of Houston. And on the right is the experimental collaborator who, who is a drosophila geneticist and uh, I'll talk about the, uh, some of the proposed experiments. So, uh, networks. Here's an example of a, like a network. This is uh, the waterfowl ecosystem uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, so the animals on top eat the animals at, at the lower levels. Yeah, yeah, and the, lights, uh, the lines in this figure tell you who eats who. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it. But uh, right now, the idea of networks uh, and why networks are useful can be illustrated by this picture uh, from Norman Rock, where, where, where there's a gossip that's going around a, a community. Now, there are, as you can see, there are, uh, there are people talking to another person, and the gossip gets propagated. Now, if you want to simplify, like if you want to simplify the representation, you can do this with a network. The simple network would be this. And as you can see, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, what's happening here is very much simplified. Uh, these nodes here are the individuals and the lines are what the gossip, uh, 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 how the gossip propagates. Uh, now, if in the picture, if there was I mean, two other people talking to say three other people in this picture, uh, as opposed to this simple, <laughs> simple linear transmission, uh, this picture would get much more complicated. Whereas a network, all you have to do would be to add some lines here. Okay, so the representation of what happened in this left figure uh, can be much simplified by using the networks. 
So as an example, if you want to look at the, like, like the waterfall picture here, but rather than giving this information one at a time, say like this ospreys eat this like large fish, rather than like having a whole lot of uh, statements like that, having a network picture like this makes things a lot simpler and it might be easier to understand some of what's happening. Okay, maybe in one year, the small fish, uh, uh, the number of small fish might decrease. And that might happen because the bald eagles and ospreys were less, uh, uh, their numbers were lower than normal. And because of that, the large fish, uh, there's more large fish and therefore there's less small fish and so on. So like having a simplified picture like this helps you understand some of the details of what's going on here. And that's the, okay, one of the primary motivations for like looking at networks and, and then to study properties of uh, like uh, uh, the compound properties of the system. So, which brings me now to the <coughs> problem that I'm interested in, which is genetic networks. So, like to do that, uh, okay, before I do that, let me start by just uh, very briefly outlining what's happening in a cell, uh, like in one of our cells. Uh, which is by no means complete, but, but I just want to like to give the minimum amount of information. So like the cells in your body have a uh, nucleus and the nucleus contains uh, uh, two genomes, one from your father, one from your mother. And so okay, that is uh, what determines essentially uh, the properties of your body. And, and there are machines that read pieces of this, uh, of the genome and, and make genes. The genes is the second level that I'm talking about, or RNA, if you will. And this RNA uh, uh, then is associated with pieces of this long genome, three billion uh, <laughs> symbols long. And the next step is that the uh, the second type of machines which read the RNA are to make proteins, which are at the lower level. Again, proteins do the uh, work in your body. And as they get degraded, all of these biomolecules get degraded and more and more are produced by reading the uh, genome. Now, okay, now what happens when you have a disease is that it's not a handful of these. Uh, yeah, I mean, it starts off with a simple, it might start off with one or two simple uh, uh, defects or mutations in the genome. Okay, but uh, these other biomolecules in the cell talk to each other. Like, so it's like a network. One, uh, one of these genes might talk to a protein, which might end up affecting the levels of another gene and so on. So what's shown in the right here, there are two different brain cancers. And so that what's shown is in uh, uh, whether a certain gene is overexpressed, which is in green or underexpressed. Underexpressed meaning it's less than the normal levels. Green, that overexpressed means it's more than the normal levels. So these two, uh, so cancer types have a large number of genes that are either more than normal or less than normal. And all this happens not because each of these uh, <coughs> genes is individually affected, but like a, two or three genes might have been affected originally, but because of this network properties that uh, the fact that one gene affects another gene that leads to this complicated uh, uh, transformations. So, okay, so what happens in the, uh, uh, in the nucleus, which is, which is in the genomes is, I mean, there can be many complicated things. One of the things that can happen is how this genome is folded can, can change. Okay, and what that does is 
that the, some of the genes might not be read because they are in, way inside and these machines that read the uh, read the chromosomes or read the genome cannot let it get in there. And so because of that, the levels of these genes might change and then the proteins might change and that might lead to a complicated picture like this top picture that I have. Yeah, another possibility is that there are biomolecules that come and attach to regions of the, uh, of the genome and prevent reading like on making the corresponding RNAs. So, so there are many, many uh, uh, ways that the, uh, like the cell can change. Cell, uh, uh, cell meaning uh, uh, what happens inside of the cell, the number of, that the, uh, the levels of the genes and proteins can change and ends up leading to a complicated process. Uh, that are the complicated states. So get this certainly needs something like a network type of analysis, at least to simplify uh, somewhat. And so, okay, why am I, am I talking about model free? Uh, uh, why don't you write a model of this and analyze it? Here's the problem. Okay, what I'm showing here in this picture that is the gene protein network that is associated with uh, prostate cancer. And as you can see, there are hundreds, hundreds of different nodes and they're connected again. These lines means that they interact with each other. And again, writing a model for something like this would be impossible. Certainly, even if you know what the nodes are, which is like, it's not even clear that we know all the nodes, but even if you know the nodes, that the interactions between them so these are complicated nonlinear biochemical reactions. So we don't know what their form is. So it'll be, I mean, it'll be virtually impossible to write a model of, a model of this to work with, which is why you need a model, <coughs> model free approach. And the idea of control, let me very briefly talk about it. So if you have a disease, you have some undesirable state, which I'm marking with this, uh, uh, circle on the left, and you want to get to some desirable state. Desirable meaning a disease-free state. So if you have diabetes, that would be the undesirable state. You want to move these cells to a desirable state. It might not be one state, but there might be a like a domain of states. Okay, so you want to generally move it here. But the okay, but again, the problem is okay if you randomly try to add a add some. Uh, increase the level of a gene or decrease the level of a gene, uh, you would not be able to control it to, it to go to this point C, but it might end up going to like to B or A or something because you control one thing uh, because the network is connected. There are many other things that are going to also be affected. So you don't know how to actually, uh, I mean, get to this target region. So, Okay, so you might, uh, like your diabetes might get cured, but you might become a monkey or something like that. Uh, I mean, you need to have, like have control to design something like this. So, okay, so because of this complicated nature, the large number of like, nodes in this network, large number of nodes that are affected by some changes in a few of them, you need a model-free approach. You cannot write down a model for this. Now the like the disadvantage of a model free approach is like you certainly cannot I mean, address many questions. In fact, only a handful of questions uh, can be addressed. If you, if you think about a complicated I mean, problem as simple as tossing a coin, you cannot, I mean, if you toss a coin a thousand times, like there's no way to know like in what sequence the heads and tails appear. But there are some questions that you can answer, like uh, like what fraction of the tosses would be heads? That's the kind of question that you can answer. So if you have these model-free approaches in general, like you can only answer a few questions. The issue is then how to answer the relevant question. Can you answer the relevant question? In this case, that is control, like a question that can be 
address with a model-free approach. And that's not clear a priori, but I, I'm going to try to convince you that it is. So, so the question then becomes, so can a system that's only partially known that be controlled? Actually, we do this every day. Uh, the cruise control in your car that has no idea what the engine is doing. Okay, but it controls the speed of your car. Okay, how does it do it? Okay, so there's some relationship between the amount of gas that's given and the speed of the car. And yeah, I mean, what the cruise control does is, if it is too low, it will increase the amount of gas. And if it's too much, it will decrease the amount of, amount of gas. And even if you didn't know what this blue curve was, okay, by this feedback control mechanism, you can get to this. Uh, the speed that you want to know. Again, I've simplified this problem. Control theorists have done a much better job than uh, job than what I have said. But but the idea is essentially this. So that the idea is you look at feedback and control uh, uh, change your control parameter according to whether the speed is higher than what you want or lower than what you want. So. This idea is a very simple idea, like it's feedback control. Okay, you don't have to know anything about the underlying system. All you look for is feedback. And okay, one thing that you need is that this, uh, this blue graph here has to be a, a relatively smooth and a monotonic uh, like curve. That's really all you need. This kind of, like this idea has been generalized to like I do two control parameters. For example, in industrial reactors, for example, people uh, I mean, want to optimize the reaction rate and they want to know how, how to control the temperature and pressure of the reactor to optimize the, the uh, reaction rate. So yeah, and there's no model that you can use. Models are too complicated. Okay, so what they do is to like, uh, experimentally measure the speed, uh, the reaction rate for several different uh, uh, pressure temperature combinations, interpolate the, 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 uh, the reaction rate curve. And I mean, very much by uh, like this analysis, then they estimate what the optimal uh, okay, where the optimal reaction rate is, or, or at what uh, temperature and pressure uh, would the rate be optimal. So, so again, this has been generalized to, uh, uh, to two dimensions anyway. Uh, now, one thing in all these cases is that the control parameters are kind of independent of what the, uh, the, uh, the answer you want is, what the response is. Response I mean, the control parameters, uh, the pressure and the temperatures are independently changed, uh, changed independently of the, uh, the reaction rate. So that's one thing to note. And okay, so for this system, for the cells, uh, that's not the case because if, if you want to change like the levels of proteins A and G and B, if you change them, okay, whatever else is like the other genes that might control uh, like the levels of those genes might also change. So it's a bit, bit more complicated in that sense. Okay, so here we start thinking about physics now. Okay, if you want to like to work with a problem like this, as physicists, what we do first is to identify like a way of uh, representing the state of the system. How do you characterize the, uh, the state of a system? So how would you do this? That there are a large number of biomolecules. Uh, Gemunu, I think yeah. we're getting some feedback from somebody. I, I think somebody's mic is turned on. It may be Igor. Uh, could you please turn your microphones off? Keep, keep yourself on mute because it reverberates a lot. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so it's still there. I think. Oops, sorry about that. Let 
because it's really hitting in the ears somehow. Uh, only one mic is probably on, and that's Igor. But anyway, I'll I'll do something. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it started raining here. Could that be it? Okay. Anyway, so so yeah. the problem with the cell in identifying the state is that there are lots of complicated phases. So okay, there's the like the genome, the chromosomes, and how they fold matters. Okay, there are the <coughs> genes, which are the second level uh, level that I'm marking. There's about 25,000 genes in, in our cells. So there's a large, okay, all of those might be active. Okay, then there are the proteins, which do the body, uh, the work in the body. Okay, uh, uh, all of them, Okay, might be relevant for the problem here. Now the issue is that these chromosomes are like it's impossible at this point anyway to uh, to find how they are folded. So I mean, even that inter if that information is useful, like it's not going to be accessible. So protein levels, we can like there are techniques to that to find the levels of protein or the concentrations of proteins, uh, individual proteins, but not to get the whole collection. Uh, the only thing that's uh, like available for us is, like, is the gene expression levels. Okay, sequencing, uh, again, many sequencing techniques can be used to calculate the levels or concentrations of all of the genes simultaneously. So that is actually an accessible uh, uh, a set of information. So now, so we have to be able, like, like the first point then is to define this state just using the gene expression levels. Okay, what happens in the chromosome, like what happens in the genome inside the nucleus uh, is in a way not relevant because it's directly not working on the, like on the, I mean the working outside of there. So actually you can, like you don't have to use this. The proteins, uh, the interactions between the proteins are like are several orders of magnitudes faster than the interactions between the genes. So actually this, so these two problems can be separated. And so fortunately you can use the data that's available, uh, meaning the gene expression levels that to characterize the state of the system. So that's one thing I will be doing. Yeah, so that is to say that the, that the systems with identical gene expression profiles, if the gene levels are all the same, that the cells will behave in the same way. Now it might be an approximation, but that's like the one thing that's practical at, uh, at this point, certainly. Let's say the problem, the control problem then reduces to, so change in the undesirable state but now I can characterize what the undesirable state is, meaning I know what the gene expression profile of that undesirable state is. And I also know what the desirable state is. So at least I have a, okay, a problem that I can define now. I have a, so okay, a certain gene expression profile, which is the undesirable one. Yeah, and I have another state, which is the desirable one, and I know I mean, what I want to do is to move from the first state to the second state. At least the problem is defined in that sense. Now, from a practical point of view, there's also an issue. Okay, can I uh, move this, I mean, move the state of this cell uh, to the target state with a, by controlling a small collection of species? If I have to uh, change like the levels of 1,000 genes is going to be hopeless. So let's keep that in mind. That's also one thing I, that I need to be looking for uh, to make the approach practical. Okay, so let's think of an example. This is one I'm, like I'm proposing to do with Greg Roman here at Old Mix. Uh, the problem is sleep deprivation in Drosophila. Drosophila is a foot fry and 
Yeah, so the, uh, yeah, uh, uh, these first flights are up for about three hours in the evening. And in the lab, what they do is to shake the, the uh, test tube there in so, uh, so they cannot sleep. Okay, and they sleep deprived them for two hours, four hours, six hours, and so on. Okay, and collect uh, their brain cells and look at what the gene expression profile is in there. So that's the, like the idea. Like, so there's something called the homeostatic network that, that is activated to, like, to prevent the trauma, uh, <coughs> trauma that results from sleep deprivation. And, and then the idea is you try to understand what this network is like and okay, how to change that network. So that's the idea for the experiment then. Uh, but the nice thing about sleep deprivation in Drosophila is that they have some uh, quantifiable behavioral change. Sleep deprivation imposes some quantifiable behavioral changes. One of them is the once you allow the, yeah, if they're sleep deprived, and if you allow them to sleep, they fall asleep faster. And that can be used as a measure of uh, like the effect of sleep deprivation. And if you allow them to sleep, they sleep for longer. Uh, it's another measure. And it's harder to wake them up. That's uh, like the arousal threshold. And also, like the associative learning skills are lower. This is just like us. So the idea is, like in normal animals, like the experiment is you uh, give them two smells and, and after one smell uh, you shock them and after you do this a handful of times they learn to avoid the bad smell and you send them through a maze and they can find out how many of them like go through the maze without uh, coming into a bad site and that'll be the quantification now, if they are sleep deprived, on the other hand, they cannot learn this. Like, or they are learning this associative learning, this, like the bad smell leads to a shock. Like they have a hard time learning and they can quantify, the researchers can quantify this thing. So these are quantifiable properties that you can, that you can test. So also in, uh, more recently, Zimmerman et al. Uh, actually looked at the genetics of, of sleep deprivation. What they did was basically what I said, which is they deprived them of sleep for two, four, six, and eight hours. And then like, look at the, identify the genes whose levels uh, have changed. And what they found is there were 159 genes which are affected. Okay, so this homeostatic network, which prevents trauma uh, from sleep deprivation is not uh, all of the genes, but a small set of genes. And this is easy to find uh, by, by current experiments. And so the assumption then is that the nodes belonging to this network, which I have drawn on the, like on the right here, like is what the network that you need to, like to actually work with. So it's much smaller than the total number of nodes. Okay, so the goal again would be to take a sleep deprived animal and you know what the state is, the normal state is, how can you move it to this normal state? So okay, can you add a few genes to, like, to move it to the normal state? So that's the question then. Okay, again, it's very important that for this to be practical that this has to be done with a small number of changes. You cannot be changing even, uh, even 150 is far too much. Okay, so let me recap what we have talked about so far. We talked about networks, uh, the network which simplify uh, the interactions within this large group of connected nodes. Okay, and it, so, so what we are doing is physics at this point, namely the first step is to try to, like, to characterize the state. And what I have suggested is that the state can be characterized with the values or the expression levels of certain nodes. Again, okay, that can be done experimentally already. Yeah, I mean, the problem is that 
okay, even that is too complicated. Okay, but the proposal is to use the response of the systems. That is the feedback control, just like what the cruise control does. Look at, so look at feedback control and how to define the feedback control. Now, okay, what you, what I will tell you next, and I'll, like, I'll give you examples for this. Okay, what you, I can't hear anybody. Can you guys hear? Uh, I can't yeah. hear anything either. Okay, I think we lost him. Um, yeah, we lost him. Okay, let me uh, see if I can reach him. I think his line is a bit noisy. Uh, Um, let's see, hopefully he'll log back on. Um, It's a little odd. Hey, what happened? Okay, uh, once it comes back up, just join. We are waiting. All right, great, thank you. All right, no problem, no problem. Ah, there you are. Uh, a thunderstorm knocked off Yonu's internet and everything, power. So we are going to be back uh, momentarily, as they say. I see them. <laughs> this is Houston in, in, in this time, right? Right. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, it was a bad enough storm that it knocked off power and everything. So his net is coming back on. Wow. Okay. Are we, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Great. Good. Yeah. You're back. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a big thunderstorm. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so can you see my screen now? Uh, not yet. No? Okay, let me try, try this again. Yep. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, sorry guys. No problem. So the uh, uh, this gray surface that I'm showing here is like it's what would happen if uh, I change two genes that whose levels are given by x1 and x2. What will happen to the rest of this network? So like so I'm representing this uh, 150 uh, 59 genes. Uh, in the vertical axis. Yeah, but the point is that it ends up, like in the example set that I will talk about, this ends up being a smooth surface. And what that what that allows is the possibility, like to get a low order approximation of the smooth surface with, in this case, with a plane, uh, uh, which I've called P1, P2, P3. And actually it turns out that this can be got, uh, this approximation can be got, uh, in this case with three experiments. So, so the idea then is that with, like with a small number of experiments, you can get a good approximation to this, with this nonlinear surface. And that, so it turns out to be all that's needed to, uh, to control the, uh, uh, the state of the network. So, okay, here's the algorithm. Uh, so let's think about a network, uh, which I'm, uh, which I'm drawing like this. Uh, the first step is to identify a node, like the first node that I want to change. So here I have marked it in yellow, and uh, the question now is, if I change this, what happens to the entire network here? Whatever twenty-five nodes here. So that's. Okay, so this vertical axis represents the state of all the, uh, the state of the network, meaning the levels of all of the all of the nodes in here. X axis. So as I change the levels of the yellow node, uh, again, by the way, this can be done experimentally already. Uh, yeah, so as I change the levels of this yellow node, what happens to the rest of the system? It's a complicated thing. I'm, I'm just drawing a very simple represent, like a one-dimensional. Uh, uh, yeah, so the vertical axis is actually like the number of dimensions in this network. Okay, so the first step is this. Uh, now the point, like I said, was this blue curve is a relatively smooth curve, like in the examples that we have, and. Okay, so which means you can do experiments. You can change the levels. So one experiment is easy to do is to look at the original network, to look at all the gene expression levels, and then that would be one point. That will be one of these red points, say the one on the left. So that will be the normal state. All Okay, so how you get that a state is to, uh, is to do a sequencing experiment. You have the levels of all the genes. Okay, so the vertical axis is done and the horizontal axis is done because you have the level of the, like of the first gene. So you get one point here already. Okay, the next step would be to do like an experiment to do it. So you do some perturbation. Maybe you add like the level of this yellow gene, add some of it into the cell. Maybe you can uh, do a mutation to reduce it. That way you get a second point. Again, again, you can do the experiment, you can do the sequencing and find out what that point is, maybe the point on the right here. So now, if there is a low or like if there is a smooth system, you can approximate the system by a line through these two points. Okay, so that will tell you roughly, as you change X, how your system is going to respond to it. That's an approximation. And Okay, so now, it, like, if the target you want to get to, like the desirable state, if it is close to this line, now you're done because all you need to do is to change X1 to this level of, of the target and, and everything else would be taken care of automatically by the network. Okay, it's very unlikely, but if that happens, you're done. Okay, if not, if the target state is far from here, so what that says is that you cannot only change X1 to get through the target set yeah, because by changing X1 is this blue curve or, like, or the approximation that you get to and the target state is far away from there. 
So at least you'll need a second node to work with. So you cannot get to the state you want to by controlling only this one yellow node, but, but you need to get more of them. Okay, so the question then because becomes out of all this, okay, what is the next best, uh, uh, next best node to use for control? So, so I want to pick a second node, a second yellow mm -hmm. node uh, that I want to use for control. There are, <clears throat> we have found a couple of ways of doing this. So one of the things is you have this target state. Uh, the simplest one which I, uh, uh, which I will tell you uh, uh, next is look at which of these components, which of these levels is most different that is, so you get the shortest distance from uh, uh, the target state Z to this line. And in that difference, okay, what is the largest, I mean, which node gives the largest contribution? Okay, that is one way of selecting the, uh, the next best node. So let's so suppose out of all these, all these genes, you get to the closest point here. Now can you find that the largest difference between these two points here, the Z like, and the closest point to the line is here. So that can be chosen as, as the next thing to change because that, so that's the one that's furthest away from the Z point. So that's one way to, uh, to pick the next node. Like a second approach is to like to identify, let's define a distance between this, like the target state and the uh, line that I have here. So I want to find the minimum, I want to find the distance, like this delta is large means the distance is larger. Again, it might be a Euclidean distance or weighted Euclidean distance. And like I look at the distance. Now, so let's think of an extreme case. Okay, if I can reach this target point, like in all the nodes except for one, how do I identify what that one is? So the, okay, so in this extreme case, I want to get to this state. I can almost get to the state. I can get to the state in every other gene except one. Okay, how do I identify what that node is? There's a very simple algorithm. So if the W, if the weight for that particular node was zero, so as the statement I said was, I would, that my delta would be zero because every other gene okay, can be brought to the right state except for this one thing. So, okay, okay, so if the weight of that was equal to zero, okay, I would have reached my target point then. So the idea then is one by one, that you set the weights to, like, to zero, that can find the shortest distance to, between the line and the Z. I can look for the shortest or the smallest value that by setting different Ws to zero. Okay, and, and you identify that as the second gene that you want to, want to control. So anyway, the idea is you're always looking for the one that's furthest away, like at some level and trying to control that one next. So, Okay, so after you do this, you have two genes to control now. What does that, uh, okay, so there are at least two ways that we have used to, like to find the second node, uh, second control node. So, okay, so now what you have is two nodes and I know what two nodes to control and I have a surface to work with now. And I want to again, approximate this surface and I approximate it by one more, uh, one more mutant. So I want to get this P3 by, so which I get by changing the levels of X3, the second gene that I, I have picked. And I, so I make a mutation of that. Again, I, I can add, add the levels of this X3, like I'll reduce the levels Okay, look what the cell does, look at the response. Again, that would be one more point. And again, as before, I can, I, 
instead of a line now, I have a surface which is an approximating uh, uh, plane that approximates the surface. And I, I once again find out if my target state is close enough to the surface. If it is, uh, I'm done. I know exactly how to control two genes, like to get close to the target point. If not, you got to look at a additional control node. So systematically, you can in increase the control nodes by looking at uh, uh, looking at feedback from these experiments. So the observation here in networks is that yeah, you can get close to the target state by controlling a few genes, and I'll, I'll give evidence for that. Uh, uh, the actual uh, nodes that you have, uh, so, yeah, so in this example, I, like, like I took this central yellow node uh, to start with. If I had used a different node to start with, Okay, I would still get the thing, but the like the control nodes, the, uh, the sequence of control nodes that I would get would be different. Like it depends on the starting node and also on the on, on the target state. So the idea is that so since there is I mean like a high level of connection in these networks, so you don't have to change everything. Uh, the biochemistry takes care of most of it. Okay, all you need to do is to change a few nodes to get to the target state that you want to. So okay, here's an example in an, uh, 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 from an experiment I'm going to talk about. So, like, so the vertical axis is the distance from the target state. And I started with a large, large distance. Uh, so my starting, uh, uh, starting state was quite far away. And by controlling one of them, I got closer. But after controlling about three of them, I got to a, I mean, got to a state which is very close to, uh, to where I want to be. And it doesn't improve very much after that. So, okay. And this result here, in this graph, is uh, we found that in so in many many uh, model systems, and also in a nonlinear experiment that I'm. I'm going to talk about. So, okay, so that is the really important result that, yeah, like in a highly connected network, like you can only, uh, all you have to I mean, do is uh, the number of controls that you need is, like, is very small. So okay, here's the result that I, uh, so, uh, 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 how do you write the model systems? Let me so, so very briefly talk about this also. Uh, so, okay, like I'm only, like, uh, yeah, I'm characterizing the system using like the concentrations of, of the genes. Suppose I have n genes I need to look at. So the 159 genes are for the sleep deprivation network. Uh, so that's my n. Again, I want to write equations for all those n equations. Let me think about what these equations look like. So the, okay, so if I'm looking at one of these nodes, like its level will depend on uh, itself. Maybe like there's degradation here. So that is what F11 is. Okay, the level of X1 might depend on X2. Okay, so that's a functional form. Again, this is a biochemical, so nonlinear biochemical functional. Uh, again, similarly, there'll be n, okay, n interactions at most, and I, again, all those n interactions I can write in terms uh, with these f's. But remember, like I'm, I'm also looking only at one part of the like of the biomolecules, namely, I'm looking only at the genes, and these genes are <coughs> produced, uh, uh, I mean, by uh, from the chromosomes or from the genome. And, okay, so that is external to the, uh, external to the system I'm talking about. So that's what this P1 is. So, yeah, so in this formulation, P1 is external. That is to say how, the, okay, how much of these genes are, so get produced from the, 
of this reading the chromosome. So that will be the P1. And the interactions between nodes are this X. So, okay, so one thing is, uh, like for those of you who know, uh, tell me more about this. Uh, you know that our, our cells differentiate, meaning uh, like our liver cells are different from our brain cells and so on. So in this formulation, that, okay, that difference comes from the P's. So if you have a different cell type, okay, it's a completely different system, namely the P's have changed because uh, the amount of genes that are so <clears throat> produced from your, uh, uh, by reading your genome is different. So the P's are different. Okay, but these F's are biochemical reactions. They don't change from cell to cell. They are well-defined biochemical reactions. So that's the formulation here. So, so uh, let's think of an example. Let's think of a two-state system. So, so I have this red line, which, uh, okay, so suppose N is two. Okay, I have this blue line, maybe the first equation, and the red line, which might be the second equation, and again, the solution is this a green diamond. So again, now suppose something happened outside, just from the genome, then maybe this P1 changed. So, so rather than having this solid blue curve, my blue curve would have turned to something like this dash curve. Uh, it's because P1 changed because there was a mutation or whatever. And my solution would have moved to a far away point like that. So that might be the defective state. Uh, now the question is, how do I bring it back here? So if I knew that, like that P1 was the, uh, was where the problem was, all I have to do is to add, like add P1 again, add some more of these genes to the system and I'll come back right here. Okay, but the problem here is I don't know that. What about, okay, if I think it's P2, what do I do? So, so I change P2. Okay, I can change it so that like, the solution comes close to here. So even if I didn't know that, that it was P1 that created the problem, okay, I could bring it from this far away point to the nearby point, like to a point that's nearby to the original state by uh, uh, changing the other thing. So this actually is really important because in these complicated systems, so we don't know like we, so you think about the cancer picture that I showed like earlier, there were six, uh, 30 genes in there that I showed. So okay, okay, we, should, uh, we don't know which ones were the original mutations. All we know is that there are 30 genes or 60 genes or whatever that's different. But what, uh, what this picture shows is that because of the couplings, you don't actually have to change the correct one, but you can change any one of them Okay, and the biochemical reactions will take care of the rest of it, uh, it to bring you uh, close enough. So, like, so in this, we are taking advantage of the connectivity of the network. Okay, rather than changing A or B, uh, A and B, we might be able to change C and D and also bring, maybe not to the exact place, but close enough to, uh, to the point where you want to get to. So that's the idea, that's why this, uh, the, the, uh, the state can be brought close to the initial state, even if you didn't know what the original problem was. So, okay, so again, in this picture, the undesirable state would be this, uh, the purple diamond. Okay, and the target state is the green diamond Okay, so you may not be able to get the green diamond, but you might be able to get close to a desirable state by <coughs> changing a different node. So that, like, again, it comes because of the high connectivity of the network, that can be taking advantage of that. So, so okay, what I've told you now is that the response surfaces can be used for control. And 
Okay, and you had systematically increased the number of control nodes uh, is to get closer like to where you want to get to. Yeah, but because of the high connectivity, you can use a small number of uh, like nodes to get close, but you cannot, uh, you might not be able to get like, to the exact point you want to, but that's uh, like, okay, because uh, I mean, as we know, uh, these cell concentrations are different anyway. So, okay, now I'm going to an example. Uh, that we've done this, like a lot of different types of uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic models, but I'm going to talk about uh, an experiment which is an electrical network. The network is, itself is this. Uh, I'm going to run over a little bit, Surajit, is that okay? So the, uh, the electrical circuit has uh, it consists of field effect transistors, which are nonlinear element, which I'm showing in this picture. See, like there's also negative in interactions, uh, which are uh, like implemented by circuit elements. So it's a very simple circuit. The, uh, the knockout mutations, which is like, uh, having no uh, uh, levels of genes is got by a uh, potential of zero, uh, which we get by ground in the nodes. And yeah, again, you, I mean, all you do is to, uh, to use this algorithm to get to the uh, start by uh, grounding one node and then find what, I mean, what the next node is and what its potential is to uh, to get to a series of potentials of this network, uh, which we uh, uh, which we preset, and these are the, the results I showed you from uh, was from that. Okay, so here's an example. We are in this experiment. We can actually get the response surface completely. That's this yellow one, and the approximation is, like is got by using three nodes in this case. And that's the blue curve. How, like, like how close are these two things? Here's an example. Yeah, so if you do a planar approximation, the rough values, are, uh, the mean values of the potentials are, are about five volts. And this linear approximation that is on average about 152 millivolts close. Uh, uh, so that's the distance between the yellow curve, the actual response surface. and and the approximation. Okay, now if you do a quadratic approximation, you can get much closer. Quadratic approximation uh, uh, requires an additional experiment. So, okay, so it can be much better, but the, uh, but the problem is if you start adding noise, it doesn't make much of a difference. Okay, so the planar approximation from a practical point of view, that is good enough. We don't have to go any <coughs> improve that anymore. So, Okay, so this picture I showed you was actually, actually from the, uh, the electrical circuit experiment. The same results happened for model systems and uh, synthetic models and it, like we, we always find it to work. So, uh, as a strategist, I'll take about five minutes more. Okay, so, so, what about other types of yeah. uh, other type of predictions? Okay, one more thing we can predict from the same formulation, like it's given single knockouts, you can <clears throat> predict the level of double and triple knockouts. I won't go into details, but it's, it's exactly the same ideas that we have. And so get okay, that we have tested in a real experiment already. So the experiment was on, uh, was the oxygen deprivation network of E. coli. Again, if E. coli are so get placed in oxygen, uh, oxygen reduced uh, region, there's a, act, a network that's activated. Uh, it's called the oxygen, oxygen deprivation network. There are some uh, uh, what are called transcription factors in this network. And, and this group of people looked at what happens with the mutations 
like, so if you remove these genes, what would happen to the rest of the network? And for whatever reason, they took a double knockout as well. So we could so, uh, use this single knockout results uh, uh, to predict the double knockout. Uh, and the expressions we, uh, we predicted from this very simple algorithm, like so 70% of them are within 95% uh, confidence interval level. So, okay, again, it's not the control experiment, but the same ideas were used for this. Uh, I'll not go through this right now, but the experiment again to like to come back to is like it's a proposed experiment on the sleep deprivation, and uh, uh, okay, so again, like I said, Zimmerman et al. have actually worked on this. Uh, like the genes of this. Here's a network that of these 159 genes that are known to have uh, interactions within them. That turns out to be 48 genes. And uh, so we have identified seven of these things to control here that they're marked in green. And uh, so this is the experiment that we are proposing to do. We have tried to get funding for this for a uh, for a few years now. We, ha we haven't got it yet, but uh, that's the experiment that we are uh, that we are proposing. We have done the double knockout experiments for this, uh, this sleep deprivation experiment. Okay, so we made 45 predictions. All of them were within 5% confidence intervals. That's the good news so far. The bad news is that the error bars are too large. Okay, so we had to do this experiment uh, uh, more, uh, more carefully. But my point is that you can do this experiment. All of this can be done. So okay, to like to summarize, like I'm talking, like I was, like I told you, for control you could either use a model, or have a model-free approach. Okay, the model is okay. So the idea is something like this: you have this beautiful uh, painting of a landscape by uh, Peter Paul Rubens. It's in the London Museum. Uh, it's an amazing picture. Has all the details of like each leaf and blade of grass, or you can so represent a landscape with a uh, abstract picture. So a modeling versus model free, it, like it's something like the difference between these two things. It's not to say that one is better than the other, each has its own, own viewpoint, but at least for control, like this model free approach is more, I mean, more practical, that was the point that I was trying to get at. And uh, uh, <clears throat> what is required is only response manifolds, like uh, approximations to response manifolds. And I've given you examples of, like, of how that works, not really in biological systems, but, but we are, hopefully we'll be able to do this experiment soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it looks like the low order approximations work well, and there might be like evolution might play a role in that, because if these responses uh, uh, change dramatically with the smallest change of like of one of the variables or some external parameter, okay, that would be bad for survival, and okay, that kind of organisms wouldn't I mean wouldn't survive. So evolution probably already make sure that these surfaces, these response surfaces are relatively smooth. Uh, okay, we have generalized these arguments for the, the periodically driven on circadian-like networks and like and the entire analysis works and the applications are, like I'm working with the Drosophila geneticists, uh, like and we have, uh, several experiments that we want to write. The sleep deprivation is one example. Uh, addiction or alcohol tolerance, like it's another one we are, that we are working on. And again, the last one is anxiety. Uh, so like, like it's, not, uh, uh, it's not surprising that, uh, that fruit flies, uh, that there's alcohol tolerance in fruit flies, of course, fruit flies, I mean, eat, eat fruit and sometimes they're bad fruit. So there's alcohol and 
like I said, that's one of the models that we want, want to work on. Also, there's anxiety, uh, uh, models of anxiety and dysophila. So these are the experiments that, uh, that we, are, uh, we, are, uh, we are proposing uh, to do for the control. And I'll, I'll just end by uh, giving a list of publications. Thank you, everyone. Let's uh, give him a round of applause. Uh, just unmute yourself and... Uh... <laughs> ah, there we go. That was, thank you. Yeah, fantastic. No, th this, is a, this is an excellent talk. We can open it up for questions. So uh, uh, please feel free to unmute can yourself. Can I ask a simple and... question? Yeah. yeah. Oh, nice, nice talk. Uh, you, can you tell, you mentioned about... Um, evolution and linear approximation. Uh, in your network, electrical network, can you quantify when the linear approximation fails? Can you change something in the property of the network until the network, the linear approximation fails? So, so one thing we tried was, uh, so if you have a small number of uh, uh, nodes, hmm. okay, you can have high levels of nonlinearity. I see. But what we found was, as you add nodes and and coupling, these things smoothen out a lot. They're not exact; but they're always um, there's always corrections. But, uh, but as you increase the number of uh, interactions and the number of nodes, these surfaces smoothen a lot. And you, in one of your curves, there seemed like a very rapid drop as a function of the node. About oh. by ten or something, it started to come down, there was a change and then became stable. Or it, it's, there's a, like a smooth transition from as a function of the number of nodes. Okay, that was this one, right? Oh, that one, yeah. Yeah, right, so what happens here is that uh, as you add, uh, add nodes, like as you add control nodes, so he, I mean, what I'm plotting here is that so the x-axis is the number of control nodes like, and the y-axis is how far this target point, right, how far the target, uh, target is from the closest point to here, like to the surface. So as you add nodes, it's very, like at some point there's a transition. And I'll tell you one more about this. So I can start with a network like this. Okay, I, uh, I can create this undesirable state by changing three nodes. Uh, right, some three nodes. Okay. Right, and now I want to get back to the original state, the desirable state. So what we find is that we can control any three nodes and to get close to the starting point. I see. Now, if I had, if I had created the undesirable, <coughs> undesirable state by changing the levels of four nodes, I need four nodes to control it back there. Okay. And the, Okay. We've done hundreds of experiments, and that's what we find. Uh, so that's why I gave that uh, okay this rough picture to show that if I had a change from one node, you could change any other node and get back. I understand. Okay. Have yes. to get back close to here, and that's what uh, I mean. I, like I haven't haven't been able to give a, like give a proof of this like at some level, but this is what we have seen, and uh, we've pretty much done about a hundred different. Uh, uh, synthetic models and hundred, I mean, many different experiments okay, on these okay, electrical okay. circuits, and this always works. Any other questions? Shudam, go ahead. Uh, so this is a perfect slide for my question. Um, so in this, in all these simulations, um, can you go backward and figure out how much connectivity your network really has? No, that's the kind of question you cannot answer by looking at the feedback. Mm. Uh, like it's very difficult to say anything about the network from uh, uh, by looking at the feedback. So that's what I said originally when I, like in that example I gave with the coin tossers. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it, if you toss this coin a thousand times, there's very few questions you can answer. Like, and it's fortunate that this control is one question that you like you can answer from feedbacks, but most questions, I mean, there's no way to get anything about the network from feedback. But is there 
some sort of a response function that you can design that you can sort of learn more about your network? I think it's going to be really difficult in, uh, when the network is large. Mm -hmm. I mean, people have done this in nonlinear physics. People have I mean, tried to, uh, I mean, there was this competition uh, uh, 30 years ago so get somebody put some data on at the Los Alamos site and said, find out what the underlying uh, 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 equations. So they even said there was a four equation system, nonlinear system, and nobody could get that. The best answer was the statistical analysis, uh, but nobody could predict what the uh, underlying equation was. So all the techniques that we know from nonlinear physics, none of them were for like we solve a system from uh, from responses. The inverse problem becomes hard, I guess. But yeah, one not in that, ones. Yeah, I mean, uh, both uh, connected to uh, uh, Professor Mahanti's question and, and, and Shudong's question mm -hmm. is, it appears that it, if your network is, uh, is genetically sparse, so for example, uh, you are talking about uh, uh, you know, the systems that are in, in early evolution stage uh, and there is genetic sparsity, there is not enough redundancy, then uh, then it would be very difficult to, to control these networks through linear yeah. or near linear approximations, right? right? One would need strongly non-linear approximations. And so nature probably uh, would prefer to have, uh, you know, uh, high high levels of redundancy just to make the networks more controllable, is there a way to measure that? I, I, I'm just curious that if yeah, there's no. a scalar parameter with which you can measure. Uh, That's a very good question. And I, so, okay, so there's one other thing. I mean, nature, of course, wants these networks to be robust, right? Robust meaning that if you change, uh, uh, I mean, one or two of the, at the levels of one or two genes that it shouldn't just, that just fly out. Mm. So like that robustness is like it's a second issue. To make it robust, you cannot have a sparse network. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know that sparse networks can be moved easily, right? So that's why this, probably the high connectivity is always, like you always see high connectivity and that's probably the reason for high connectivity. Yeah, but the bad thing about that is if you do move out of this state, like that new state is also robust. Okay, so it's hard to bring it back as well, and that's why this uh, like this very precise controls are needed for that. I mean, yeah. So if one could somehow define some kind of a scalar parameter, right. one could actually assess the uh, assess assess the tendency of species to become extinct. Yes. Uh, right, because well, we're, we're in the midst of a mass extinction. So I. I, yeah. I I don't know, I'm probably stretching it too far, but I'm just curious whether one can actually have an extinction risk associated with the, uh, with the genetic network of, of species. Yeah, it's a different level. That, some ecologists, for example, think about ecosystems that are robustness, right? So, okay, yeah. so you know that this, uh, whatever the Asian carp that has come to the, yeah. in the Midwestern state that, that, that one species destroys a whole, like entire ecosystem, right? And mm -hmm. so that's so how do you make the ecosystem robust? So let's see how best to like to counter the effects of that one invading species. These are again questions of network control. I mean, one of the example that you already know is that uh, I think back in the nine, uh, around 1990, uh, they introduced gray wolves into the Yellowstone. Uh, uh, yeah, Yellowstone and Midwestern far, uh, uh, woods, right? And that created mm -hmm. havoc in the right. uh, ecosystem. So, like, so can they have used network analysis to like, to minimize that risk? Maybe uh, they should have added uh, uh, gray wolves with something else as well. Like, and that would have mitigated some of the problems. And these are the kinds of problems that you uh, you can try to address. Yeah, I mean, they're fantastically important problems. I mean, uh, 
not to mention the medical applications i mean the other question i had uh, sort of was <clears throat> about side effects in the genetic context uh, uh-huh. also in the general context but 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 side effects in this case uh, are probably factored in uh, as, as nodes so it doesn't matter yeah right if you can genetically like the assumption is that if you can move it genetically close to the state where you want to there will not be side effects right so i uh, mean side effects are because you haven't got to the correct state like right. the other gene has changed that part of the yeah. right yes yeah. so that was the original motivation to even look at this thing right can you design a yeah. uh, design a therapy that so it will leave no side effects yeah. the other questions i'm sorry to be asking questions i i, I, I was just getting ready please ask questions if you feel like if you have any uh, you just have to unmute yourself uh, of course i have a question yeah, yeah. please sorry sure. uh, so a uh, quick question on are there any physical constraint in prescribing the target state uh so let's say if you are doing for the genetic network if you are doing it to the gene expression levels there's almost none because people can uh, uh find the levels of all of genes uh, even of individual cells now so uh, i mean in that case the characterization can be done uh, essentially perfectly with some noise of course but otherwise it can be done uh, uh that now if you are looking at a ecosystem it's going to be a bit of a problem because you don't know like so you may not know all the species in the ecosystem so you have to work with what you know then like and that might be a limitation i see and a quick follow up question to understand it correctly uh-huh. so the target state is prescribed on the full n dimensional space or is it on a lower dimensional manifold so whatever is like it's appropriate like for the problem at hand right uh, uh, so for this problem for example uh like so if i look at the sleep deprivation network for example there's only 159 genes at most that you need to work with that we know from experiments again i mean the experiments like i said were done by uh the uh sleep depriving these animals for 2 4 6 and 8 hours and then looking at what gene levels change uh, the other ones so out of these 20000 genes that they looked at there was only 159 that were changing uh with increased levels of sleep deprivation so rather than looking at the like the entire 20000 you have identified the like the relevant network and that only had 159 genes now even then uh, so it's like i was saying if out of that 159 only like only 48 genes were known to be connected to uh, uh, connected within that network uh like and so we have very little knowledge of so what these networks are so all you have to work with is these 48 genes and that's what that we are planning to do by the way we are uh, like i'll show you one other result uh Okay so this one is for alcohol tolerance like or like it's a model of addiction so Atkinson et al in 2013 looked at alcohol alcohol tolerance or in drosophila and found uh, I don't remember the number 100 some genes that were affected by alcohol addiction so the idea here is that uh, these animals when they are uh when they are given alcohol uh, there's a network uh, your genome gets refolded in a different way uh, to tolerate alcohol uh, now the bad thing about that these animals can tolerate alcohol therefore they take more alcohol <laughs> like and it's a model of addiction so again that network when, when we looked at it we actually actually did the network here i can again find only that like only a small number of nodes are known to be interacting within that set so this is the only the only set we can work with and that can that should be enough uh, so I, i mean i guess your question is 
like so if you have genes outside of this which might be changing can like so, like so when you say come close to within here if, uh, we might still be far from uh, some of the other genes yeah i don't know what uh, like anything more that uh, more that we can do because this is all we know thank you multi system failure is what i was thinking about i mean is there a difference between the between the target state that you define because the target state is in multi dimensional space so it can yeah. it can be associated with multi system multi organ failure or multi system failure i i did that might be too complicated at this point so uh, as yeah, so a can you s uh, take both those at one system is your question right yeah so you have like one system but you have multiple failure points or multiple target states that must be reached instead of one and those target states may not necessarily be trivially correlated so so your target state itself becomes a multi dimensional disconnected uh set maybe so not. so one th yeah so one thing you would know is that if you okay so again if you have diabetes for example and and uh, if you have a normal person okay so that target state would be that of a normal person right so yeah. you know uh, where to get to and again there might be multiple so i i i guess there's going to be multiple possible target states near that neighborhood yes exactly yes okay but that should be okay because anyway i mean even our cells uh, i mean different cells from individuals it's like it's not unique it's uh, Uh, it's some neighborhood, really. Okay. So that target should be somewhere in that neighborhood. That's all that. Uh, okay. Okay. That should be. would really be noted. Uh, okay. Uh, we have. We can accommodate a few questions if there are. But you have to unmute yourself. Uh, okay. hearing none uh, let's thank uh, gemunu again for a fantastic talk and uh, really this is very enjoyable thank you for taking the time you get nothing oh, in return yeah, accepting accepting our applause so <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> thank you very nice thank you so much thank and, you and uh, i'll put this thing up on youtube uh, so okay so yeah available all right thank you thank you guys okay thank you guys bye 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 bye